The Boer counterattack has begun. And earlier in the video, I spoke of the necessity of having the right man for the job. Well, we have on the summit Major General Sir Edward Woodgate. But unfortunately, we'll never really know how capable he might have been in this circumstance, as within a very short time, he is struck in the head by a shell fragment and a badly wounded is evacuated from the summit and plays no further role. The command shifts to the senior colonel, Colonel Blomfield. Colonel Blomfield decides that he needs to dislodge Boers from Allo Knoll. That made sense, but possibly his method uh, didn't make quite as much sense. And he leads a bayonet charge. The bayonet charge is shot to pieces by Boers at a range of 300 meters. Blomfield wounded, he's taken from the battlefield. And the command now devolves upon the next senior colonel, Colonel Crofton of the Royal Lancaster Regiment. We don't really know too much about Crofton, but it appears that he, who has also not been in a battle before, panics somewhat. He does send a despairing signal to General Warren and then largely disappears from the scene. Warren also um, rather shocked receiving the news that his general was dead. He wasn't actually, but he may as well have been. Um, immediately dispatches his favorite commander to the summit to assume command, Major General Cook. You might remember, of course, that Cook is suffering from the after effects of a broken leg. And poor old Cook begins hobbling up the spur, but it's very firmly imprinted on his mind that when he arrives at the summit, he will be in command. Not too long afterwards, General Redvers Buller on Mount Alice, who's not directly involved in the battle, remember, but he hears something of the casualties among senior officers and makes a suggestion to Warren. Remember, he makes a suggestion. Had he given an order to Warren, he would automatically be back in charge. And that doesn't seem what Buller wants. The suggestion to Warren is if you want to hold the hill, I recommend you put a good, hard fighting man in command on the summit. My suggestion is Thornycroft. Warren is probably not delighted by that suggestion because he had the man he wanted, Cook, who was on his way up the spur. But when the boss makes a suggestion, what can you do? And so Colonel Thornycroft receives a signal uh, that he's appointed to the temporary rank of Brigadier General to assume command. Rather unfortunately, and no one realized this, but by the time he received that news, he had taken a very bad fall and uh, wrenched the ligaments of his knee rather badly. So he's now the third commander on Spionkop with a bad leg. Hobbling up the spur, General Cook is not told by Warren that Thornycroft has been appointed to the command. Why? Well, we don't know why. Did uh, Warren forget? Or did he deliberately not tell Cook? Remember who he wanted to be in charge? Cook. When Cook reaches the summit, discovers that Thornycroft has got a temporary rank of Brigadier General, who would be senior? Cook would be senior. Maybe that's what Warren wanted. But of course, it doesn't necessarily always work the way you want it. And what happens is that Cook will never get onto the summit. Probably in, in pain, exhausted, he stops at the signal station and delegates his authority as commander to a further Colonel Hill. So now it's getting very confusing. We have Thornycroft who's been told he's in command, Cook who's told he's in command, Cook has delegated this now to Colonel Hill of the Middlesex Regiment and tucked away on the hill somewhere is Crofton. Remember Crofton, the man who panicked and Crofton's being a bit sulky and still insisting to anyone who listens that he really is still in command of the Lancashire regiments. While the British had been preparing their initial defensive arrangements here, the Boers had begun their counterattack. Their general Louis Boerter had marshaled 600 odd men and more tellingly, He'd arranged that all seven of the Boer guns that were available to him had been moved to within range. And as the mist begins to lift, Boers begin climbing the hill along these slopes. And Boer guns from the Twin Peaks, from the Rangeworthy Hills, and from a position a little to the north of this map, began firing. The initial clashes between Boer and Brit will happen along the crest line. Some of these clashes will be at very close range. But eventually the British will largely, but not entirely, 
uh, secure the crest line. But the Boers are not far away. And one of the reasons for the high attrition rate in this battle was that it's fought at much closer quarters than the Boers would normally have chosen. The afternoon is dragging on. Colonel Thornycroft is becoming increasingly despondent. Messages that he's been sending to Warren have been unanswered. We would discover later that Warren had been responding, but to Cook, not to Thornycroft. I must emphasize at this point uh, the conduct of the ordinary British Tommy. Your ordinary British soldier is suffering tremendous casualties. He's had no water since early in the morning. His tongue is swollen in his mouth. The bodies of his mates are lying all around him black with flies. But despite this, he's continuing to fire disciplined volleys at the crest line. And from an account that we received from a 17-year-old Boer who stated that the effect of Lee Metford volleys at 20 meters had to be experienced to be understood. So whilst we might shake our heads at the actions of the officers, let's never lose our respect for your British Tommy, who joined for a shilling a day. But when he had to put his hand up, he certainly did. The Boers, on the other hand, are also behaving with great bravery. But the reality is that they are trickling away from the battlefield. They are becoming despondent. And of the Boers who were told to climb the hill 600 odd, possibly only 400 ever did, the Boer general during the course of the day would get other Boers from all over the place to try and boost the numbers. But by mid to late afternoon, there are probably not more than 200 Boers on the hill. We now look at one of the most famous incidents. Earlier that morning, General Warren had signaled across to the British right. The British right is where General Buller is on Mount Alice. But the signal doesn't go to Buller. It goes to a Major General Littleton, who is in command of the British right. It was a bit of a despairing signal from Warren, which simply said, render what assistance you can your end. Well, this gave Littleton an opportunity. He wasn't told what to do. Littleton, possibly the best of the generals in this area, decided that um, he would try something. He believed, probably as the Boers believed, that the British couldn't take one hill and hope to hold it and leave the enemy in all the other hills. And so he decided that he would send one of his regiments to attack the Twin Peaks to the north east. You may recall that General Littleton, based here where Buller was in Mount Dallas, had received a signal earlier that morning to render what assistance he could on his side. Well, having thought it through, um, he marshals his men. It was probably 12, 12.30 that he moved some of them from across the river where they were based on these little hillocks, others from a rear base. They cross at a drift uh, not far from the Spearncorp itself, and the Scottish rifles will move towards the spur but the significant thing, the King's Royal Rifles move across to take the Twin Peaks. And that is one of the more remarkable episodes in this battle. It will be recorded as an event, possibly the most dramatic feat of arms performed by any British force during the entire course of the year. It's an interesting story because General Buller up here became very unhappy when he saw these men moving across the plain in front of him and tried to recall them. And a very brave young officer suppressed those signals. And eventually, the attack in the Twin Peaks goes ahead. 900 men. They will lose 125 during that assault. Rifle fire, little avalanches started by the Boers for those slopes are precipitously steep. They will lose all of their officers but three. But eventually, with the final banner charge, will secure the Twin Peaks. Their colonel, Colonel Robert Buchanan Riddell, sends a signal back to General Littleton saying we have taken the hills and unless ordered otherwise, I intend to stay. And the battle looked won. But there was still a final card. And that is that the triumphant Colonel Riddell would be killed. Littleton appears to lose his nerve and order withdrawal. And the British snatch defeat from the jaws of victory when they abandoned the Twin Peaks. Did Thornycroft here on the summit see what was happening over here? We'll never know. What we do know is that he'd reached the end of his tether. And late in the afternoon, 
he will take what for him would be a uh, potentially career-ending decision. And this we will deal with in our final episode next week, The Battle of Blood.